The word health conveys an impression of something in proper functioning condition, or in other words, a state of well-being. As humans, health relates to the ability of our bodies to perform certain functions, like circulation, respiration, and digestion within a measured set of standards. In a similar way, landscapes, including riparian areas, perform certain ecological functions. Riparian health means the ability of a stream or a river floodplain, a lakeshore, or a wetland to perform functions like supporting biodiversity and filtering stormwater runoff. But how do you measure that? What does a healthy riparian area look like? This video will provide an overview of what to look for to determine riparian health for your stream or small river. For more information, refer to our Riparian Health Workbook that describes each indicator in more detail and how it's scored. Riparian areas are the transitional zone between open water of a water body and the drier uplands. These lush green belts are built and maintained by water, either from a high water table or flooding. If we or our land use change the plants, soil, or water regime, we can impact the health of these sensitive but vital areas. While every riparian area is unique, just like every person is unique, there are some common aspects we look at to measure health. The first indicator we assess is vegetation cover. In general, the less total plant cover there is of any kind, the less healthy a site is. So green is good, but what types of plants are best? Healthy sites typically have a diversity and abundance of native plants. In other words, naturally occurring species that are best adapted to the local ecology, soils, and climate of a site. Where we start to have problems with this natural balance and resiliency is when we lose plant cover or native plants are replaced by non-native plants. Most troublesome are noxious and prohibited noxious weeds and other invasive plants. Such plants are alien to the natural plant community, spread rapidly, and are difficult to control or eradicate. Many displace preferred forage plants for livestock and wildlife. Consult with your local municipality to learn more about invasive weeds in your area and management options. Early detection and rapid removal is key to keeping weeds in check. Invasive plants commonly take hold where our land use disturbances create bare soil or impact the abundance of vigor of desirable species. A riparian site with none or only a few invasive plants scores healthier than a site with numerous large weed patches. Just like invasive plants, Disturbance-caused plants, when abundant, indicate a shift in the natural state of a plant community. Disturbance-caused plants are common introduced weeds like dandelion, agronomic plants like Kentucky bluegrass, smooth brome and clover, or native plants like wild strawberry. These plants are often the first to establish in disturbed areas and many have aggressive, fast-spreading rhizomes allowing them to expand even under heavy grazing use or mowing. Extended cover from invasive and disturbance-caused plants usually means a loss of biodiversity. This can impact functions like erosion protection, drought resilience, or wildlife habitat structure. The next set of indicators we look at focuses on the riparian tree and shrub community. A self-sustaining riparian forest or shrubland is integral to soil stabilization, nutrient and moisture cycling, and fish and wildlife habitat in most riparian sites. First, we look to see if preferred trees and shrubs like poplars, willows, or red osier dogwood are present and regenerating. Do we see enough seedlings or saplings in the understory, or are there only mature aging plants? Next, we look at if preferred trees and shrubs are being used by livestock or wildlife lightly or more heavily, and whether human or beaver removal of woody plants is limited or higher use. 
human impacts can be long-lasting if our land uses impede natural regeneration processes. Balsam poplar, aspen, and willows have co-evolved with beaver and typically regenerate quickly after use. Lastly, for woody plants, we look at what proportion of the tree and shrub community is dead or dying. Where we see a lot of dead or dying plants, this can point to problems either from disease, overuse, or dewatering. Where we have healthy, woody plant communities, we typically have less bank erosion. Deep binding plant roots from willows, poplars, and other desirable riparian plants perform a structural role, helping to hold the banks together, trap sediment, and resist erosion. This is not the case where we have shallow-rooted weeds or turf grasses like Kentucky bluegrass. We also need to consider the foundation that supports healthy plant communities, the soil and hydrology of a site. What indicators can we measure to assess the physical health of a site? A good starting point is to look for human-caused bare ground or exposed soil from our land use activities. Bare soil without protective plant cover will quickly erode and contribute to water quality issues. Topography and soil permeability also need to be considered. When our land uses alter the shape or contour of a site, create paved or impermeable hard surfaces, or compact the soils, we reduce the ability of riparian areas to store and absorb water and support abundant plant growth. Remember that increased soil compaction or paving equals increased unfiltered runoff, polluting our streams and water bodies. The last indicator we assess is whether a stream or riverbed is downcut or incised so that floodwaters can no longer access the floodplain as frequently as it should. Although we often think of flooding as a bad thing, riparian areas are the natural release valve for high flows, providing the area for flood water to spread out and slow down, deposit sediment, and soak in. If flood water reaches only a very narrow area or doesn't even reach the floodplain, the stream may be deeply incised. This can lead to the riparian area drying out and causing problems downstream. Funneling floodwaters into a confined channel increases its velocity and horsepower, increasing erosion downstream. Both on-site impacts and upstream activities can influence the degree of incisement. Like your doctor's visit, after your blood pressure, breathing, and other functions have been examined, you get a bill of health. In a riparian health assessment, we do the same sort of thing. Some indicators are weighted more importantly than others, and they all get added together to come up with an overall health rating. Conducting a riparian health assessment is a great way to identify issues and showcase successes. This tool can help inform what management changes may be needed, and it allows you to monitor the impact of those changes. Now that you've tuned your eyes to what to look for, how healthy is your riparian area? Stay tuned for a Riparian Health Field Day in your area or contact us if you'd like more information.